Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Brian Hurley. I'm acting as chairman of the Zoning Board of Appeals for the purposes of considering the comprehensive permit application involving 648 to 652 Canton Avenue and Milton. Uh, this has been a bit of a long siege of public, public hearings. I think we've all agreed that tonight will be the end of the public hearing process. Uh, and once we complete the public hearing process, we will then go into a period of time where uh, we will have meetings about public meetings, but not hearings uh, between the three board members, uh, at which time we will discuss the, the merits of the application, whether or not it should or should not be approved. And if approved, uh, what kinds of conditions we would like to see uh, imposed with respect to that approval. We have a lot of precedent in the town that we can work with in terms of draft, drafting our conditions, if that's the way the vote goes. Um, we also have the good services of Judy Barrett and her company who assist in the process of uh, drafting opinions and crafting uh, conditions. Um, I, I thought it would be helpful for everyone to understand that when we do close, we have a 40-day period in which to consider uh, in the public meeting process, the merits of the case and, and to reach conclusions. Uh, and we have to complete that and issue a decision uh, by my count uh, on Monday, uh, May uh, May 2nd. Uh, that would be the 40th day from the, from the close of the public hearing. I, I thought it'd be helpful tonight. We, we've had a flurry of written materials that have come to the board in the last uh, few days I just want to recite what they were, and I'll be honest, most of it I have not read uh, because of just the timing of it was such that there was really no opportunity to do so. Uh, we received a, a fairly lengthy uh, document this afternoon from uh, Denny Swenson, who I see is, is with us tonight, who's the planning board chair for the town of Milton. It's, a, it's an extensive document that came in later this afternoon. Uh, we received uh, a document or a memorandum from Peter Dillon, at Tetra Tech, which is also dated today, Tuesday, March 22nd. Uh, that was provided to us some, at some point today. Uh, received yesterday from Edward Ned Corcoran, uh, who's also with us this evening, uh, a memorandum uh, relating to conditions. Uh, if the board were to grant a comprehensive permit, uh, this was his vision or his thoughts on uh, what would be appropriate conditions for such, a, such an approval. We received a letter dated March 18th uh, from Tetra Tech, uh, and that was signatory to that. That was signed by Sean Ridden, who was with us also this evening, and that that dealt with some of the uh, water issues that we've been hearing about and frankly struggling with uh, throughout the course of this hearing process. We received from Denny Swenson on March 15th uh, an email addressed to me. Uh, briefly talking about the uh, the application and, and promising uh, the, the document that we received today that was the, sort of her views and the planning board views, I guess, uh, of the application. We received uh, another letter dated March 14, 2022. Uh, I can't remember who that came from. But it was from, it was from I'm sorry, it was from the town administrator, I guess. We received a letter dated March 13th from Cheryl Pagayas whom we've heard uh, orally uh, during the course of the proceedings, uh, but it sets out her thoughts on, uh, on, on the application. On March 11th, we received from Mr. Schomer a, uh, link, a, a letter uh, summarizing the position with respect to the issue of uh, uh, groundwater mounding, which has been subject to we spent some time on. Uh, another uh, email from Mr. Schomer on March 10th, uh, we received a, a Letter dated March 10th from Mr. Tagayas. Uh, and I guess that's really the, the complete list of the, of the recent materials that we received. And I'm sure that the members of the board will, will read carefully all, all of those as well as previously submitted materials uh, as we go through the deliberative process uh, and, and consider in, in context of public meetings uh, how we will vote and move forward uh, with this application. So that's a, that's a long prelude. Uh, I think that our principal plan tonight was to, to hear from uh, interested parties and with respect to uh, conditions, um, we, I think we had at least thought we would close out sort of the evidentiary portion of the, of the public hearing at the conclusion of last week. 
there may be people who want to have a final word. And of course, we will always hear from anyone that has some sort of fresh thoughts uh, on the subject. But the principal objective tonight is to hear from the participants with, with their thoughts on how we might uh, how we might condition this in the event that we will vote in, in favor. And I'm sorry for being so long-winded, but um, those, are the, those are the points I wanted to address uh, as we open the hearing. So with that in mind, I guess probably the, the first person I'll turn to is Mr. Schomer. Uh, and Mr. Schomer, I don't think we received anything from you with respect to conditions. Um, is that right? Correct. Uh, what we would propose to do tonight, Mr. Chair, and I, I forgive me if I misunderstood your intentions at the last hearing. Uh, my understanding was that uh, your your intention was to go through the list of requested waivers uh, for the project, and I'm prepared to do that tonight. Uh, with respect to conditions, um, what I would suggest is that the board members take a close look at the decisions that were issued by other panels of the board recently with respect to the, the 582 Blue Hill Avenue project and the uh, Ice House project, because I believe those, those decisions can be mined for many of the same conditions that would be applicable to this one. And I think overlap quite significantly with uh, many of the comment letters that we have uh, received in the last few days. I, I can assure you that we were, plan we were not planning to start tabula rasa uh, with respect to conditions, we were going to look at uh, recent precedents as, as an aid uh, and, and probably in wholesale fashion adopt uh, many of those conditions um, in the event that we were vote, to vote in favor of the project. But why don't you go ahead then, uh, leave the conditions aside once you talk to us about the art of your testimony with respect to the waivers that you alluded to a moment ago. Sure. If you'd like, Mr. Chair, I can run through uh, the waiver list. Um, and put that up on the screen to aid in uh, going through it. If you'd like to hear that at this time, um, I do see um, Chair Swenson of the Planning Board is on tonight. I don't, I don't know if you wanted to recognize her before we go into the, the waiver list. Okay, I, I thought I did, but welcome, Mrs. Okay. Swenson, to uh, to our last public hearing this evening. A good evening. Thank you for your introduction, Mr. Shoma. Why don't you go through the waiver issues? Put that up on the screen now and I'll just I'll run through uh, Mr. Chair and if you or the other members have any questions about this um, this list please, please uh, feel free to stop me uh, can can you can everyone see the the, the list up on the screen yes okay well, I can so I'll, I'll just run through uh, the, this is the list of requested waivers I did review this in the last uh, week or so and confirmed that the dimensional requirements of the project have not changed uh, since the date that you'll see down here in the bottom left-hand corner of November 29th. Uh, this list was submitted on that date together with the most recent updated plans for this project and the, the dimensional particulars and list of requested waivers have not changed since that date. So that's the reason why we did not submit any additional materials with respect to waivers within the last couple of weeks. And I know that there was some discussion about whether that would happen uh, it was not it was not necessary to do so. So I, I didn't feel the need to to clutter the record with an additional filing. Uh, so this this is the, the 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 list of requested waivers of record, I would say. And if we start at the top here, we the way we have organized this is we've run through the uh, the bylaws of the town of Milton in numerical order, starting with uh, the lowest number, of course. Um, and that would be chapter six, uh, which is the Milton police regulations bylaw. Uh, this requested waiver is, uh, this is a request for a waiver from the separate local permit required by the Milton Select Board uh, for the proposed curb cut and street sidewalk opening. Um, and this bylaw requi does require a separate, uh, a separate local permit from that board. And so we're requesting that that permit be issued uh, instead by this board as part of the comprehensive permit for the project and that the proposed curb cut locations and street sidewalk opening location uh, be approved as part of that permit. Um, what I would say just by, by way of, of adding to this, uh, in, in prior projects, including the 582 Blue Hill Avenue project, which as you, as you know, I represented the applicant on that as well, uh, there was specific language in the board's uh, final decision of approval uh, that specified that um, matters such as 
uh, betterments and, and local um, approval by DPW and things of that nature uh, were not waived uh, by, by the granting of waivers such as this. So we're not seeking any, any uh, waiver from, from the, the typical, uh, the standard permitting process through DPW and, and public works and engineering uh, to get approval of that and to have them uh, review it as part of the construction of this project. Uh, but the, the only request in this is the, the separate local permit from the select board. Why, why, are you, why is this one different than the rest? Different in, in, in what way, Mr. Chair? Different than that you're asking for it. I mean, you're not asking for many of the others that would be in the ordinary permitting. Isn't this in the ordinary permitting at all? What I meant by that in the ordinary permitting is the, the standard process of review uh, through the, the, the daytime government, as it were, of, of the, the town of Milton. So a building department, the DPW engineering, this, on the other hand, this is a permit that's issued by the select board of Milton. Um, so this is a permit that we're asking that this board approve as part of the comprehensive permit for this project. I mean, I don't, I don't mean to be difficult with this, but I mean, I'm not sure I get the daytime and the nighttime distinction. Um, it's, it, the distinction, I would say, Mr. Chair, is... I, I apologize, I, I spoke over you. No, go ahead. I, I would say the distinction of this is the what we're not requesting a waiver from and what was not waived as part of the previous decisions uh, for 40Bs recently issued by the board are the, the standard back and forth process of review by, uh, I would say departments and department heads with the particular expertise in these areas. Uh, we, we understand and, and agree that it's critical that those authorities have the, the jurisdiction and the authority to review this, this project and the particulars of the project and the technical aspects of it. Uh, but for, for something like this, uh, this is more of a, I would say a, a, a formality uh, that, that there be a separate local permit issued by the select board and, and my expectation would be that the select board would issue a permit like that only under the advice of the town departments and department heads uh, that have the technical expertise for that sort of decision making. Um, so that's the reason uh, that we're requesting this waiver. Um, does that answer your question, Mr. Chair? It does. Okay, good. Uh, so the next waiver request that we that we're requesting is uh, chapter eight of the, the town of Milton bylaws, which has to do with removal of trees and stone walls. Uh, this largely overlaps, I would say, with state statute, which has similar protection for scenic byways. And it also has some uh, overlap, I would say, with the rules and regulations of the, the Milton planning board, uh, which in this instance has de designated Canton Avenue as a scenic way. Um, and as we'll see later, we are requesting a waiver from that as well as part of the, uh, the planning board's rules and regulations. Uh, so what we are requesting in this is that the uh, any work, including the removal or, or uh, temporary relocation of stone walls, uh, as well as trees, uh, be approved as part of the comprehensive permit for this project. Okay, so if we if we go from there, um, this takes us into the I would say the meat of the the waiver list, which is the uh, the town zoning bylaw, which is Chapter Ten of the the, the Milton uh, Town Bylaws. The first in this in this chapter is uh, Chapter Ten, Section Three A and B, which have to do with the principal and accessory use regulations. Uh, we're requesting a waiver from this to authorize the project because the proposed use of multifamily residential in specifically 116 units is not an authorized use in this zoning district. And so we're requesting that that use be authorized pursuant to this section as, as, as part of the, the comprehensive permit for the project. Fairly straightforward. Would this use be authorized by a special permit or is this just not an authorized use at all? It's not an authorized use at all, is, is my understanding, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, we're not requesting a special permit, um, simply the authorization of the use um, pursuant to the permit itself. The, the next section has to do with signs and billboards. We're requesting a waiver of this to authorize the signage that's shown on the project plans, and that would be typical outdoor directional signage and a um, street sign to, to guide uh, 
uh, passersby and and uh, and residents to the site, um, address signage, things of that nature. And this as well was was subject to uh, specific conditions in, in prior approvals that specified uh, the signage that was uh, that was being authorized and the process for doing so. Um, so I think the, the term billboard, I believe, is used in the bylaw. We're not obviously requesting permission for any billboards. It's it's merely the the signage for the project and uh, typical residential signage uh, that that you would see in any kind of project of this nature. Can I ask a question, Mr. Chair? Of course. Good. Um, who, where would that approval come from normally? From the Board of Appeals, because you don't mention in the. Uh, I if I if I'm not mistaken, uh, Mr. Daver, I, I believe there is a sign permit application that is that goes through uh, DPW. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, I can look into that for you and and hopefully provide a, a more definitive answer on that. Um, I, I, I was just curious while we were while we were on it, uh, who would who would have the authority to approve them normally? Um, usually, um, usually signs are approved through the select board, and and sometimes they have a sign review committee. Thank you. Thank you for Thank that. You. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, moving on to the to the next uh, section four a has to do with earth removal and fill. Um, we're requesting a waiver of this to authorize the filling and removal of uh, grading work and removal of soil as shown on the project plans and, and nothing further and beyond that. Uh, the, the next section is a, um, it's a zoning bylaw that has to do with wetlands. Uh, we're requesting a waiver of this regulation in its entirety and uh, requesting that instead the project be permitted under the, uh, the State Wetlands Act. And as I believe we've mentioned at some previous hearings, uh, because of the proximity of the offsite intermittent stream, uh, we are subject to Conservation Commission approval. An application has been filed with conservation and we'll, we will be moving forward uh, with that process within the, uh, the coming weeks and months. Um, so we're, we're requesting a, a waiver from this to authorize the project to be permitted subject to Conservation Commission approval. What will the, re what will the request be to the Conservation Commission? What exactly are at when you be asking them to approve? We have we have filed a notice of intent uh, for approval of the the project as shown on the plans that you have you have been reviewing, and that we are asking uh, this board to approve as well. Um, that would include specifically the uh, stormwater management structures under the the uh, state stormwater standards, which are incorporated in the regulations of the Wetland Protection Act. Um, so in this in this case, because the Conservation Commission has jurisdiction um, over the project, uh, it would take jurisdiction over the uh, the entirety of the stormwater management system. And we've seen in um, in in other hearings, specifically uh, Blue Hill Avenue, and I, I apologize for keep uh, to keep bringing that up. Uh, the commission has has taken uh, a view of that project not just with respect to the the small portion of that site. Which is within its jurisdiction, but uh, has has is considering the entirety of the site, due to the um, due to the effect that the remainder of the site could have on the the portion that, that's within their jurisdiction. I would expect them to act in the same fashion here and review the entirety of the site, not just the the area within 100 feet of the offsite stream. Okay. Okay. So next uh, is, cha is chapter 10, section five, which has, has to do with height. Um, we specify here the exact height and number of stories for each of the buildings. Um, you'll note here in uh, the, with the, the double crosses here, there are only a few of the buildings that we're, we're requesting a waiver for because most of the buildings uh, do comply with the, the town's height and stories requirements. So. Uh, the buildings are identified by type and by number, and th those are shown on the plans of record. So, for example, here you'll see buildings four and seven. Those are proposed as two stories, uh, 28 feet, 10 inches, uh, and those do comply with both the height and the stories requirement of the zoning bylaw. These buildings here, building six, buildings one, three, and five, and buildings 10 and 11, do not comply in one way or another, specifically 
uh, this building here, building six, three is three stories rather than two and a half stories and is proposed as 37 feet rather than uh, 35 feet. Similarly, uh, for buildings one, three, and five, um, they comply with the stories requirement, uh, but they are two, they're proposed to be two feet taller than the maximum height. And uh, similar for buildings 10 and 11, which are the, uh, the townhouse buildings in the rear, the far rear corner of the site, which is most proximal to the Winter Valley a multifamily development to the rear of the site. Those are proposed as three stories and uh, 40 feet, four inches. Um, and as we specify in this waiver request, we are also requesting that the board approve the grades around the buildings. Uh, and that's due to the fact that they, of how the, uh, the zoning bylaw defines building height, which uh, would, makes reference to the height around, uh, sorry, the grade around buildings. Um, so we are requesting that that grade be approved and once approved that these heights and storage requirements only for these, uh, these buildings here uh, be approved. The other ones do comply. Perhaps I'll, I'll pause there and see if the members have any questions about that. No, I'm okay. No? Okay, hearing none. Uh, next, we go to ch uh, Chapter 10, Section 6, which are the dimensional particulars of the project. And we, again, as we did with height, we outlined all of the applicable requirements. Uh, so lot area frontage, front yard, side yard, rear yard, building coverage, floor area, and minimum open space. Most of these requirements for this project are complied with. So you'll see here, there is one building which is shown on the project plan, which has a proposed side yard setback of 14.8 feet, where uh, 15 feet is required. Uh, there is a proposed building coverage of 19 and a half percent, whereas 15 is the requirement. And we are requesting a gross floor area of 44.8 percent, where 30 percent is the requirement. Um, the remainder of the dimensional particulars of the project comply, including the open area, uh, which provides over 70,000 uh, square feet in excess of what's required by the zoning bylaw. Okay. Okay. Uh, moving on to the next one, uh, this, this section uh, 6A1 uh, provides that there may not be more than one dwelling unit on a single lot. We are requesting a waiver of that because we are requesting 116 dwelling units on this, on this parcel. Um, okay. Moving, moving on, um, the, the following sections, uh, they're, they're highly technical and I would encourage the members to, to read through them uh, closely, uh, but they pertain to buildings in front yards, side yards, and rear yards. And they have a number of specific uh, requirements with respect to what is permitted in front yards, rear yards, and side yards. Uh, we're requesting a waiver from this primarily uh, for the fact uh, that um, certain structures may be, may be deemed to constitute a structure or a building, such as a, a retaining wall in particular. There are, as, as the members know, a number of retaining walls shown on the project plans, uh, which are located within the various front side or rear uh, yards. So we're, we're requesting these waivers for approval of those primarily. So that, that pertains to the section uh, 6B, 4, and 7, 6C, 1, 2, 4, and 6. And the next one is uh, D, 1, 3, and 4. And then that, they're, they're all for the same reason. Um, the next section has to do with parking. And in this section, we are requesting a waiver of the, the regulations and the technical specifications that are applicable to off-street parking uh, to authorize the parking arrangement as shown on the project plans, which as I outlined here, uh, are, is proposed to include 185 parking spaces, which is a ratio of 1.59 per unit, uh, which, which includes 12 garage spaces for the townhouse units and 173 surface spaces around the site as, as shown on the plan. The, the next waiver request is section 8A, uh, which this, this really uh, piggybacks, I would say, off of the request for approval of the, um, the non-conforming use as multifamily um, residential. Um, we're requesting a, a waiver of this solely 
uh, to the extent that the zoning bylaw would instruct the, the building commissioner as zoning enforcement officer to enforce the zoning bylaw to prohibit this use. Uh, we're not requesting anything further than that, uh, just authorization of the use and the project as shown on the plans. Okay. Uh, the, most of the remainder of these are, I would say, they're, they're more technical waivers and, and process waivers. Uh, section 8B has to do with uh, filing of plots and plans. Uh, we're requesting a waiver of that to the extent that it, it might vary technically from some of the requirements of, of Chapter 40B and its regulations. And we would request that the, uh, the plans that we have filed to date be uh, deemed accept, acceptable under this provision in terms of specificity and, and dimensions and, and scale and things of that nature. Um, the next section, 8C, has to do with the issuance of occupancy cert certificates. This, this is another one that piggybacks off of the, the previous section. We're requesting that uh, by the issuance of this permit, the project be authorized and that the building department be authorized to grant occupancy certificates once uh, it is satisfied that the project has complied with uh, such conditions that the board may impose if you do uh, vote to approve the project. Uh, similar for uh, Section 8D, which pertains to site plan approval. This is a process waiver. Um, typically, for a project like this, site plan approval would be required. In this instance, we're requesting that the board's review of the comprehensive permit uh, encompass site plan approval and that any, any site plan approval that's required for the project be granted as part of this permit that we're requesting. Um, Next is 9B, which is notice requirements. Um, we, have, we have filed the application in compliance with Chapter 40B and the regulations under Chapter 40B, uh, which incorporate by reference Chapter 40A, of course, and we would request that the board uh, waive this section to the extent it differs from that and deem the notice that was provided to neighbors, which in this case was um, all parties, I believe, within 300 feet of the project site. Uh, that that be deemed su su sufficient for the for the notice of this hearing. Next is 9C, which has to do with special permits or other permits. We are requesting a waiver from this to the extent that any any additional special permits or zoning permits under the zoning bylaw would be required, uh, and and instead are requesting that any such permits be authorized as part of the comprehensive permit for the project. Moving on, that completes the uh, the zoning bylaw waivers um, and takes us into the uh, the Milton Wetlands bylaw as well as the uh, Milton Stormwater Management bylaws. Uh, so, in with respect to the Wetlands bylaw, as I mentioned previously, uh, this project is subject to Conservation Commission review and approval under the State Wetlands Act. What we are requesting in this case is a waiver only from the requirement to obtain a separate local permit from that body under the, the town's local storm, excuse me, lo, local wetlands protection bylaw, and instead approve the project as part uh, of its review under the State Wetland, Wetlands Act only. And I make a note that uh, we have designed the project to comply with, this, with the, uh, the town's 25 foot no disturb zone as shown on the project plans, and we're, we're not requesting uh, any waiver from that, uh, that performance standard as part of the project. We don't intend to go into the 25 foot no disturb zone uh, in any way. Uh, next is the town. Can, can I ask a question? Go ahead, Ted. Yeah, what, thank you. Uh, so what are, the, what are the other differences that you would be, um, you know, by requesting this waiver that you wouldn't be that the applicant wouldn't be subjected to if if a waiver were granted. Well, so we'll we'll go in get into it in in a moment. I believe on the following page, uh, Mr. Daver, the 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 Conservation Commission has, in addition to its wetlands protection bylaw, it does have a set of rules and regulations. Uh, mm -hmm. We're not requesting any waivers from its its typical performance standards uh, in its review of the project. We're 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 willing to, to comply with those. Uh, for example, the, the 25 foot no disturb zone. The only difference is when, uh, when Allen and Major, which is, which is the, uh, the, the project engineer, as you know, 
when they filed the application for the uh, the notice of intent, they filed only under the State Wetlands Act, not under the, the town's local bylaw. So in a typical situation, a project would apply under both and would technically receive two separate permits, one under the state act and one under the local bylaw. Here in this case, we're asking the board to approve the local permit as part of the its review of this project subject to the Conservation Commission's superseding review of the project under the State Wetlands Act. Okay, but I'm not I'm not completely sure that you indicated that that they had that the applicant had comply with performance standards, but are there any other regulations under the Milton bylaw that um, would apply that aren't under the state bylaw, under the state statute that, that would be waived? So I would say the answer to that is procedurally, yes, there are some provisions. Uh, the, the local bylaw does grant the Conservation Commission broader discretion in terms of the timeline for reviewing and approving projects of this nature. Um, however, it, this project is still subject to the, the standard state statute uh, of um, uh, Chapter 44, Section 53G, which does authorize the Conservation Commission to, uh, to obtain outside uh, peer review consultant at our expense. Uh, so that would apply as well. Um, so primarily what I would say is it's, it has to do with the time standards. Uh, so the time standards that would be applicable to the Conservation Commission's review would be those that are set forth under the, the State Wetlands Act, which are, uh, there are tighter time frames. So we're, we will be requesting the Conservation Commission to review this on, on a slightly accelerated time basis. Uh, but that having been said, um, it's what I would say is it's it's um, it's not very well received if if a project ends up in the hands of uh, of Mass DEP and the the project proponent has not provided all the information that's requested by the local commission. So we will be cooperating with the local commission. Uh, it's routine for uh, extensions of time to be granted, as has been done in this process, uh, significantly beyond what's required by statute. So we'll work with the commission on that. Um, but that's um, that, that I, I would say that it's primarily that the, the time standard is 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 what's the missing element. Okay, I, I mean I would since, since it came up at the last hearing about not having answered um, all the questions or provided data that was requested by other hydrologists, I would. You know, just want to make sure that there isn't, you know, something in those regulations. I mean, we can review them, but uh, that would, um, that perhaps it wouldn't be appropriate to waive. Okay, thank you. If I could just just comment on that, just just briefly, um, what the Conservation Commission will be reviewing is is for compliance with the state stormwater standards, and and. I, I don't want to put words in 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 Mr. Reardon's colleague's mouth, but my understanding of reading his letter today was that we had demonstrated uh, to his satisfaction compliance with that with respect to the groundwater mounding issue. Uh, I, I fully expect the commission will have its own hydrology expert will will retain peer review uh, as it's doing on the Blue Hill Avenue project uh, currently, and so we will be working with that peer reviewer and providing any information that he or she. Uh, finds to be necessary for for review to confirm compliance with the with the state standards. I think the the issue that you're getting to, Mr. Daber, has to do with a disagreement between ourselves and and the consultants for the neighbors as as far as what what the appropriate standard of review uh, is for a project like this. And in our view, uh, the, the the testimony of the the neighbors consultants were were requesting that we provide information that for a project of this nature go far beyond what's required by law, but that's that's a difference of opinion, I suppose. Okay. Thank you, Ted. Yep. Thank you. Okay, so I'll, I'll move on then uh, to the next, um, the next one. This is, I would say, this is provided for informational purposes only. Um, this is the, the town of Milton stormwater management bylaw 
Um, the the way that this bylaw is is drafted and phrased, it's it's applicable only if the conservation commission does not have jurisdiction over a project. Uh, and the reason for that, I presume, is to provide a hook uh, for the town to have local a local permitting process for oversight over a uh, proposed stormwater management uh, system such as this in order to comply with the MS4 permit that the, the town has with uh, the EPA. Um, in this case, the project is subject to Conservation Commission review, and, and that will include, as I mentioned, the stormwater management system. So our, our view is that this bylaw does not apply, and based on that, we are not requesting any waiver from the town stormwater management bylaw. No waiver of any kind is requested. This is just for informational purposes so that the board understands our position as to it, its applicability. Okay. Okay. Uh, next is the uh, chapter 22, which is the uh, Milton uh, colloquial known as the demolition delay bylaw. Um, the, in this instance, the, the um, home at 648 Canton Avenue uh, was listed by the Milton Historical Commission as a historic site uh, during the permitting process. I believe it was about a month before the, the application was filed with this board. Um, but the timing of that is immaterial. It has been listed. It is uh, deemed to be a historically significant structure by that commission, and therefore it is subject to the town's uh, demolition delay bylaw. Um, we are requesting that that demolition delay bylaw be waived. Um, as, as the members may, may know, uh, these kind of historical protection bylaws, um, they do not prohibit uh, structures such as this to be uh, to be. Uh, demolished. It's it's really just uh, it's a delay to encourage owners of land to consider other options for development of, of, of sites. In some instances, that um, that makes sense. And, and as the members may know, my clients uh, did make the decision in the case of uh, 582 Blue Hill Avenue to preserve that structure uh, because it was it was found by our team to be something that could be incorporated into the project in a way that that made sense. In this case, um, that did not pan out, and we we made the determination that was not not feasible for this project. Uh, so we are we are not proposing to save that that house. Uh, we are requesting that the board authorize its demolition as as part of the comprehensive permit for the project. So this isn't a permit that would have been required, is that right? It's it is a it is a permit, Mr. Chair. It's a, a demolition delay permit. Um, which would, would either authorize uh, authorize the the demolition of the of the structure immediately, subject to conditions that the historical commission might impose, or would impose a, a waiting period. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe it's 18 months or two years or something of that along those lines. And, and who issues that permit? The historical commission. Well, what it the effect that it has is it 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 effectively. Uh, prohibits the building commissioner from issuing a, a demolition permit for the for the for a project like this. So we're, we're requesting that this board authorize the issuance of a demolition permit under this bylaw. Okay. I'm just trying I'm just trying to understand this. So what happened, what would happen if a building commissioner said no? Would you go to the Board of Appeals with that? Well, what the, what the building commissioner is looking for in a case like this, uh, Mr. Chair, he's looking for whether there is historical protection and whether there is authorization from the historical commission to proceed with the demolition in spite of its historic uh, value. And so lacking authorization from the historical commission, we would we would be subject to the waiting period that's prescribed in this bylaw. So in this case, what the what the building commissioner will be will be doing is looking to this board's decision for his authorization to issue a, a demolition permit. Okay. Okay. Um, so the next, the, the remainder, I believe, are are technical waivers. Um, this next this next request has to do with the Milton right of way. Uh, regulations uh, division two and we outline uh, somewhat in here uh, what we're requesting here uh, it, it does this bylaw and we discussed this with the the panel of the board that was uh, overseeing 582 blue hill avenue 
Uh, this bylaw does technically specify that uh, a separate local permit from the select board is required for certain work approving uh, work with respect to rights of way. Uh, we're requesting a waiver only from that that permit. Uh, I, I don't I don't know that the practice of the select board and, and whether this is something that's enforced it from my reading of it it's it's been some time since I've reviewed it uh, but it, it struck me as, as the kind of regulation that's probably been on the books for for a number of decades and, and may not be something that's that's applied in every case. Uh, but be that as it may, it is on the books, and so we're requesting that the waiver from simply from the the select board's review of the the right of way. In in the right of way in question is is what? Uh, that would be uh, Canton Avenue, and I okay. believe it would also apply to Mergewood Road, since we are proposing work to connect to that. Okay. Uh, the next uh, is the. Um, we're moving beyond uh, town bylaws and getting into, excuse me, um, local regulations of, of local boards and commissions. Uh, and this request is for a waiver of uh, section six of the Milton Conservation Commission's uh, rules and regulations. And perhaps I can I can highlight the language here. And this is this is particularly um, the the passage that we're requesting a waiver from. Um, what a provision like this is is drafted to do, uh, and and I've seen this applied by other commissions, not specifically this one, um, but this is really this is a catch-all which allows the commission to impose standards and requirements that go beyond uh, what is specifically provided for in their local bylaws and what's provided for in the um, in the state wetlands act. So, so we're requesting a waiver from that. Uh, and, and instead requesting that uh, the project be reviewed only under the, the State Wetlands Act. Um, as I believe I mentioned previously, uh, we're, not, uh, we're not requesting any, any uh, waivers from the performance standards that are set forth in these rules and regulations, uh, really just uh, this requirement here. Excuse me, you have a question, Mr. Chairman? No, go ahead, Jim. Please. Okay, so so the standards that are referred to in this language aren't time standards. There are any standards that, that can be imposed. Yeah, and, and I think I think the the key language here is uh, such additional standards as may be required. And what that does is that gives the commission authority to go in and if they if they see something that they consider to be of particular importance, even if not specifically protected under this, the local uh, bylaw or the State Wetlands Act, it allows them to go beyond. So what I, just by way of example, what I've, I've seen other commissions apply language such as this to say, uh, for example, in the case of, of a vernal pool, which is not, not an issue here, there's no vernal pools in this site. Uh, I've seen commissions say that uh, you, the, the, the project cannot go within 200 feet of a vernal pool, even though its jurisdiction ends at 100 feet uh, from that wetland resource. So th that's just an example of, of how a provision like this could be used. And so we, we don't wanna run into a situation where we're, um, we're subject to a requirement that goes beyond what's, what's uh, provided for in the law. Yeah. It just it seems to me the Conservation Commission might be in a better position to decide that than we are. But... Anyway, okay, thank you. Welcome. Okay, so um, just continuing on, the next request is from the this board's uh, rules and regulations for comprehensive permit applications. Uh, this is something that we're, we're requesting as a matter of, uh, of just providing a record. Um, we have, we believe we have complied with the filing requirements and we re request uh, this waiver to uh, for the board to deem the filing requirements and the, the plans that we have provided uh, sufficient. Uh, if there are additional plans or copies that the board would uh, would request from us or, or require us to file, um, I, I would be happy to provide additional copies, but we believe we have, we've provided all the copies that have been requested. And this is intended to approve that, uh, as well as the, uh, the filing of fees and deposits uh, this is something that we are we are putting here just as a, a preservation of record in the 
um, I would I would hope um, unlikely event that an appeal has to be filed because uh, housing appeals committee precedent requires the applicant to uh, to to file uh, filing fees that are that provided for in local bylaws uh, even where where those may be deemed to be uh, unreasonable or unacceptable. It is my hope that there will be no appeal of this project by my clients. And in that case, uh, this waiver request would become effectively a moot point. Okay, um, the next is the Town of Milton Planning Board Subdivision Rules and Regulations. Uh, we're requesting a waiver from this uh, because as part of the uh, this uh, project, as you know, we are proposing to combine uh, the project, two parcels into a single project site so we're requesting a waiver from the technical filing requirements with respect to approval not required plans. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we are requesting a waiver from the uh, particular sections with respect to scenic byways, uh, which as I mentioned earlier in my comments, uh, Canton Avenue is designated by the planning board as a scenic byway. So in that case, there would be a requirement to file for and obtain a, a separate permit from the planning board to authorize work in and around the scenic way due to the presence of uh, stone walls and trees in the right of way. And so we're requesting that this board instead be the approval granting authority for, for that work as shown on the project plans. And this, th that, that specifically, as I think I mentioned before, that overlaps in large part with the uh, town's right of way bylaw that we, we talked about earlier, as well as state statute having to do with scenic ways. Um, so the final request, uh, this is perhaps uh, the most unusual request because this is not typical of, of uh, 40B projects. This has to do uh, with, the, um, with the historical permits that Attorney Corcoran located and uh, we're still not sure where he located those old permits uh, from the early 1950s, uh, which pertain to the use of Mergewood Road um, and as I believe has been discussed at, at, in, in fairly great detail, uh, some of those uh, conditions have to do with limiting the use of properties on Mergewood Road for single family residential use only. Uh, we, have, we have argued, and we, we don't need to go into this um, further here, we have argued that that's not applicable, uh, not enforceable, and in any event uh, would not be violated by the project. Um, that be that as it may, uh, as a belt and suspenders measure, we are requesting uh, that this board issue a release of those conditions and the specific permits are referenced here. They're dated August 14th, 1953, uh, May 16th, 1955, and February 15th, 1957. Um, in prior correspondence that I have filed with the board, there is a specific precedent uh, for the Board of Appeals to, uh, that authorizes the Board of Appeals to waive or release conditions of prior local approvals. Uh, and we're requesting that the board do just that in this instance. Um, I would note that although the, the permits in question pertained in a manner of speaking to uh, a subdivision of land, uh, the permits themselves were issued by uh, obviously a different panel of the Board of Appeals, um, given that they, they took place over 60 years ago. Um, but it is the same board that, that approved those conditions and we're requesting that this panel of the board uh, release them for uh, to approve the project. And, and what's our authority to do that? The, the board has authority under Chapter 40B to modify or release conditions of prior local uh, permits to the extent necessary to approve a 40B project. Uh, okay. I can, that specific, that specific language in 40B? It, it's it's a HAC precedent. I can provide you uh, with the, the case citation if you so it's like. Not, it's, not in the, it's not in the statute. I don't believe it's in the chapter 40B statute itself. I, I don't recall whether it's specifically noted in the uh, regulations under, under Chapter 40B, but it is clear precedent uh, from the HAC uh, that this board uh, does have that authority to, to do. At some point, could you just, I mean, there's a zillion 
HKC decisions and some of them are hard to find. Could you just give us the, the names of those cases so we can read them? Because this seems rather extraordinary that we would have the power to go back and undo things that were 50 years ago and are not before us and we know nothing about. But, um, but if you could send me those hack decisions or the citations to those decisions would be great. Certainly well, I, I did provide it in a previous letter and I'm as we're as we're talking here, uh, perhaps if the spotlight goes to someone else, I'll, I'll try to find the citation while we're still on the call. Okay, that's great. I, yeah, I think, I think there was a case also that was cited that had to do with uh, where private owners uh, property rights were concerned that um, the Board of Appeals couldn't in the context of a 40B hearing um, uh, make a decision which would um, affect those property rights. Um, I, 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 it was a long time, it was a few months ago at this point that I read it. I think Attorney Corcoran provided uh, the site, but okay. I think what you have in mind, uh, Mr. Yeah. Daber, is there is case law that, that provides that the, the board cannot compel private property owners to, to do things such as convey easements. Uh, that is not what we're requesting that the board do here. Uh, we're, we're simply requesting that the board uh, with uh, waive a condition that is held and is for the benefit of the town of Milton itself, which is the restriction in, in these permits. Mr. Corcoran, you have your hand raised. Well, when do we when do we let this uh, when do we let this let this finish and then we yeah. can turn to uh, Mr. Corcoran okay. with his his take on these things. But thank you. Thank okay. you. Uh, so it, I believe that concludes the waiver list, Mr. Chair. Yes, that that is the end of the waiver list. Um, so I'll I'll cede the floor uh, unless you have any further questions. Uh, no, I think. Uh, for the time being, I think we, we've covered everything. So why don't we go right to Mr. Cork, I'm sorry, to Ned Cork and, and uh, Ned, can you just briefly respond to the, the waiver request specifically if, if you choose to? Sure, uh, I just have a couple of uh, specific comments. One is uh, under, on page two of the height regulations, I would just point out that the waivers that are being requested are waivers of height on top of what I think is essentially a full story of Taylor. So they, they, they're giving um, heights of buildings, but they're not giving heights uh, from existing grade to the new, uh, to the height top of the building, but taking into account the new grade. Um, the other comment that I would make, and I think is significant, and I think um, Mr. Davis started to point out appropriately, is that um, those permits uh, that were issued in the 1950s were issued for the benefit of the owners of those other properties. This is a common scheme uh, development of a number of properties on Mergewood Road. My clients, one of my clients is the owner of the fee in that road uh, and in the 50 foot right of way that the road uh, sits within. And the balance of my clients, uh, at least the ones who live on Mergewood Road are the beneficiaries of those permits. Um, you don't have the right to um, undo those permits without, without um, taking into account the burdens and benefits that all of those parties share. Um, I think this is a matter for the court. It's not a matter uh, for the board. You don't have the right uh, to waive uh, the, the requirements contained in those permits. It's not simply for the benefit of the town. Uh, this is for the benefit of the, all of the owners of the property on Mergewood Road. It seems like a, an interesting and somewhat complicated issue that we'll have to that we'll have to deal with. We certainly can't affect property rights, um, so we can't we can't affect easements or grant easements or uh, those sort of things. But the question of what we can do with those permits from back in the nineteen fifties is a, is a different issue from that uh, that we'll have to wrestle with. But my Having said that, my client, Berger Bernefelt, and his wife, Cynthia Montgomery, own the fee in the right of way. And any change would be affecting a, a change in the easement to the use of that right of way. And that would be, that would be an imposition being uh, imposed on a private, uh, a separate private owner. The other owners have the right to use the road with, a, with easement rights. 
and, to, and 652 has an easement right to use the private way for the purpose laid out in the um, in the permits that were granted. I just see what you're saying, Mr. Cork, and I, I but I think my view on that is is that's a that whether or not there's an overburdening or an interference with that easement, that's a land court issue. That's not for the Board I, of Appeals to decide. I, I agree completely. I think it is entirely a court issue. It's not for this board to determine. I may, Mr. Chair, just to provide a little context for this issue, I just want to remind everyone the Mergewood Road connection is an emergency access gate only. In our conversations with Chief Madden, he, he said that he would anticipate that this entry be used uh, sporadically, if not rarely. Uh, currently, there is a single family house on this Mergewood Road, which if we had, I don't believe our traffic engineer is on the line tonight, but I'm sure if he were asked, he could provide uh, traffic generation estimates for a single family house, which is probably somewhere in the range of two to five trips a day. Uh, so what we're proposing is actually uh, far from overburdening an easement is actually proposing less use of it and in fact improving the state of the road to allow for the fire fire access uh, for this this site. So if attorney Cochran, I mean he's been he's been raising this issue for the better part of two years. I have yet to see a land court complaint filed by him on behalf of his clients. If he feels that this is something that is important to track down, will certainly be, be willing to respond to that and, and litigate that issue. That having been said, we have provided evidence to the board that we have a deeded access easement in this uh, Mergewood Road. It's not an issue of overburdening in my view. It's not an issue of the board granting an easement or requiring uh, Mr. Cochran's clients to grant my client an easement. We already have that, that's indisputable. Uh, all we're requesting is that the board release conditions of approval of house lots and there is case law, and I can, I'm happy to provide this to the board, that conditions such as that are held and enforceable only by the municipality. They're for the benefit of the municipality. They may be of some ancillary benefit to Attorney Cochran's clients as well, but the holder of those is the town and the town alone. The town has the authority to release them. Okay. It sounds like you were making those arguments uh, to Mr. Corcoran for your future court matters rather than to the Board of Appeals, because we are obviously not going to delve into the scope of rights in uh, Marishwood. Um, Understood. We'll, we'll consider the issues as they relate properly to uh, matters under 40B, but those issues are for the private parties to deal with. So why don't we move on from that? Those were my only comments uh, relative to the request for waivers. Thank you. Okay. Does anyone, anyone else have comments specifically with respect to um, some or all of the, of the waivers that have just been outlined and discussed? Uh, Building Commissioner, I can make a couple of comments if you... Mr. Prindek, I'm always happy to hear from you. So yes, please do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. With respect to the um, uh, re request for waiver on the signage, uh, signage is prohibited in residential district, any type of permanent signage. So any signage would require a variance from the Board of Appeals. And with respect to the historic demolition bylaw, anytime someone applies for a permit to demolish a house that's more than 75 years old, uh, we, I am obligated to refer to the, to the historic commission. They make two determinations. One is the, is the, is the structure historically significant? And if so, uh, is it preferably preserved? If they determine that it's preferably preserved, then they can then place a two year moratorium on the demolition of that building. So I just wanted to bring those points of clarification up. Just out of curiosity, what happens after the two year period? The, uh, then the, the house can be, de then the, the permit to demolish can then be issued. Is the, is the two years designed to give the town or the historic commission some ability to do something to perfect that historic issue, or is it just simply a two-year delay? Uh, it's basically a two-year delay. What the historic commission often does is they try to encourage encourage relocation of the structure, or sometimes they they lean towards replication uh, if the building is shown to be unsalvageable. Um, but it's also just a tool to discourage the dem demolition of 
historic structures that are preferably preserved, determined to be preferably, preferably preserved. Understood. Thank you, Mr. Prender. You're welcome. Anyone else? Mr. Ridden, I think you were going to speak tonight. I'm understanding why you had some thoughts on some of the matters before us here. Um, nothing in particular, but we did submit a letter. Um, I actually just told Pete Dillon, who was on in the audience, to, that he that I'd text him if we needed him. Um, I'm happy to explain what we said in our memo, but it is pretty short and pretty self-explanatory, so I'm perfectly comfortable just reading it for you okay. in the record. I, I think I noted that we had received that uh, when I, at the beginning when I recited all the various um, materials that we received over the last week or so. That, so we we can read that, Mr. Mr. Reardon. We, yeah, and just will. in the way of information, it, it's it, re, it reinforces prior opinions, but it's done by Pete Dillon, who's a who's our on staff hydrogeologist who does modeling and has done contaminant transport for thirty some odd years. So there's someone far more experienced in these matters than I am. Appreciate that. Okay. Anyone else wanted to speak on the, on the subject of conditions? Uh, um, Ms. Swenson? Chair Hurley, I'd, I'd be happy to talk tonight. Um, uh, thank you, Chair Hurley, members Brown and Daber for inviting the planning board to provide comment and suggested conditions. Um, this project's been a bit of a moving target, so I can only imagine the challenges for all of you and tracking the many moving details. I've been going over my notes from watching meetings over this past year, going through the documents online, looking at guides I have for the planning board and examining other special permit and site plan approval conditions for projects approved in Melton. It is not my intent to tell another board what to do. Um, my goal here is to offer potential conditions. You may choose to incorporate if you see fit um, as many of you know, the planning board is a deliberative board that considers impacts on long-term planning. Like your board, we do have projects that come before us, and our goal is to steer those positive in a positive direction. Um, so wherever we are in a process, it is all about trying to make it better for the site, better for the community, and better for the town of Milton. The following comments and document will be in addition to what the planning board has already contributed. Uh, I think we have said this in a prior letter, but I just want to reiterate, this project is not generally appropriate. Mass Housing's design criteria for 40Bs include the requirement that the conceptual project design is generally appropriate for the site, taking into consideration integration into existing development patterns. The planning board still feels the proposed 40B height, size, and footprint is a serious concern. It is too massive for the site and fails to properly integrate the proposed buildings with the surrounding area. The Historic Commission has demonstrated the outstanding historical value of the house and landscape on this scenic road and on the abutting Holmes Lane. I struggle to find comparably large and dense projects in town and had great difficulty finding any. We do have some deve dense developments in town that work, and the reason they work is because there's enough open space around them so that the density is in the middle of the site and the open space around the density creates a healthy buffer for those that live in the development. And the positive use of this open space has proven to help these new communities to blend into the broader community around them. For example, take a look at Fuller Village, Home Inc, Winter Valley, and 88 War. The residents of these developments all benefit from the thoughtful planning and the use of the space and land topography. Affordable housing can and should be, should be good, and it can be done well with thoughtful planning. Thoughtful development here on this site could also be profitable. The project should generally conform to the Commonwealth's sustainable development principles embraced by DHCD, and it does not in the following ways. It fails to meet the requirement to concentrate development and mixed use. Most of the site will be covered with massive buildings, driveways, and parking lots. The project is not near service or shops. The project fails to protect land and ecosystems. The applicant states that it will not build with 100 feet of a wetland, it says nothing about the removal of substantial trees and the impacts to the abutters trees, which in turn may affect that wetland. There is no transportation choice at this proposed site. It is too far from the transit lines. 
The applicant admits the project does not promote clean energy or use sustainable resources. The project is not consistent with plan regionally as it does not in any way meet the expectations and goals of the town's master plan and will in effect is exacerbate the serious traffic issues on Canton Avenue and beyond. Site design challenges. Part of site design is walking through construction management, or in other words, to evaluate how the project will actually get created. For example, where are they going to store the materials? How are they going to move on the site during construction? How are safety vehicles like fire trucks going to be able to enter and exit the site if they need to during construction? If there is no resolution to obvious issues, then adjustments to the site plan are needed. When I examined the construction management safety and sustainability, it became clear that the footprint is too large to make this a workable or sustainable site. When one evaluates the site plan in relation to healing the site after construction with trees and landscape, it is clear that the building and pavement footprint is too large to make this a workable and sustainable site. The stormwater engineering issues also demonstrate that the footprint is too large to make this a workable and sustainable site. Stormwater. The ideal projects that come before us try to honor what is there and what is around it. As a planning board, we take the stormwater issues very seriously. Based on impressive expert testimony and studies by at least two engineers, it seems the site cannot handle the proposed density without a detrimental impact on the neighborhood surrounding the site. It is clear that bringing the density and the footprint down in size is one obvious way to address the engineering stormwater issues. I've been on a subcommittee of the planning board assessing grade and fill impacts and how to limit those impacts with stronger rules and guidelines because we've seen many issues where sites have been aggressively clear cut of trees and plant life, leveled with grade and fill work done and retaining walls installed to hold the new infill. This has been done with great detriment to our town. We have seen the negative impacts and the difficulty in the actual healing of the site after this, after this sort of work is done. Applicants that have become, come before us show us nice drawings of how it will look, but during the process and after it is complete, we go to the site and it is a disaster, a costly disaster that is left to neighborhoods and to the town to clean up for years to come. This aggressive proposal reminds me of these sites, but tenfold because of the sheer density and aggressive nature of not working with the topography of what is already there. Putting five to nine feet of infill on top of that much of the site is simply extreme. The site is unique in that it has a high water table. So much of the site is impervious. The building area is so great. It seems that the approach is to build the storm water management system into the new land infill. As noted, two engineers have outlined what, the, what they see as potential flaws in the stormwater system. At the same time, there is no countervailing expert testimony or study by a highly qualified source. In short, there is no equivalent peer reviewer assessing the same type of studies and analysis. This has left an issue that needs resolution wide open. I'm not an engineer, but I have listened to a lot of engineers and approaches to stormwater systems on many construction sites in my five-year term on the planning board. We have had large projects like the Pulte project and the Carberry Walcott project. On the planning board, if all of those engineers were before me, having that debate about the stormwater systems, just as you requested, I would want to see the proposed modeling and I would want to see the data that has been withheld. A possible condition for a peer review of the stormwater plans in question could be Prior to permit, it is required that an independent specialist engineer, peer reviewer with experience in groundwater and stormwater solutions. In other words, someone with, someone with experience with a unique set of challenges and goals on this specific site, review all the data in question. The specialist engineer would also be required to do his or her own equivalent modeling and studies. The goal is to get to the bottom of the key questions. Can we prevent water from blowing out of the stormwater system? And if so, how? If how that will be accomplished can be demonstrated in a set of plans, then another possible condition could be the following two requirements. An independent inspection of the stormwater system at seasonal intervals 
over a significant period of time paid for by the developer. Second, a bond or a commitment for the repair and or replacement value of the stormwater management system. If the stormwater system were to be tested and to fail, there would be a mechanism for the developer and for the contractor to be held accountable to fix or replace the system. Our town does bonds for tree plantings, roadway systems, and for stormwater systems. The system would get checked period periodically and the bond would get returned once agreed upon conditions and a significant time lapse confirm the system is in compliance. A bond or performance guarantee is a reasonable standard practice approach. The figure of the bond would be determined by the reasonable cost to cover what is at risk. The stormwater system has potential impacts to the abutters. I understand when you sit on a board like this, you are between a rock and a hard place. I know you don't wanna deny a project and cost the town a ton of money and legal fees. And you also don't wanna approve something that is going to have stormwater blowout with water going on to other properties and costing the town and the citizens money for years to come. I understand it is late in the process to bring in new expertise, but the significance of stormwater issues on this unique site has been becoming clearer over the past year now, making new expertise advisable. The applicant has not demonstrated that the extreme infill approach to this site will work. You have asked repeatedly for the apples to apples engineering comparison, and you have asked for data information, and you have experts who have spelled out the need for that information clearly. The planning board can reject a site plan on the basis that the applicant fails to furnish adequate information to make an informed decision. I have abstained from taking a vote on two occasions because the applicant refused to provide the data that I was asking for. I do not know the rules for the Board of Appeals, but I can certainly empathize with the difficult position you are in. This is a very tough spot for a volunteer board. I have a, I have a long list of potential site plan conditions I could quickly read through and I've provided to Chair Hurley. On-site equipment. All utilities shall be visibly screened by evergreen shrubs or solid fencing and surrounded by acoustic enclosure with industry standard sound absorbing materials for any noise making equipment. If a generator is installed, it shall be surrounded by industry standard sound absorbing materials appropriate for residential communities. The generator shall be visually obscured as much as possible from neighboring residents. Any equipment showing or material screenings shall be made to look visually attractive in keeping with the architecture. The residential ventilation, heating, and cooling systems shall be as quiet as reasonably possible using state-of-the-art technologies appropriate for residential communities. Further, this equipment shall be surrounded by noise-reducing materials appropriate for residential communities. Equipment shall be centrally located and, if possible, be placed within a well in the roof and visually obscured as much as possible from neighboring residents. Any equipment showing or material screenings should be made to look visually attractive in keeping with the architectural elements of the building. Alarm systems will be kept to the minimal, safe sound levels according to regulations and up-to-date standards. On-site lighting. On-site lighting shall be compliant with the standards of the International Dark Sky Association or equivalent standards. Lighting shall be set to the minimum level while still ensuring site safety and security. And lighting shall be set on a timer or a motion sensor where possible to prevent unnecessarily unnecessary light spillover. Lighting of entries and balconies shall be in the roof or building wall directed downward to avoid light overspill. Outdoor lights shall be placed at or below 10 feet high and pointed downward. Exceptions can be made for site safety with the approval from the plan, planning director of Milton. Um, signs at the entry or within the site. I, I don't know if you are going to be doing signs, but I provided a couple conditions if, if you do. Um, size materials and design of signs shall be consistent with the scenic way and shall be approved by the select board or municipal sign approval body as provided in the bylaws or regulations on signs. Sign lighting shall be compliant with the standards of the International Dark Sky Association or equivalent standards. Lighting shall be set to the minimum level while still ensuring site safety and security and lighting shall be set on a timer where possible to prevent unnecessary light, unnecessary light spillover. Um, landscape plan. 
I don't know if it would be possible to look at the landscape plan while, while we're talking about this section. Um, I could point to a couple things if we can. If not, it's okay. Um, but I'll, I'll just begin and if somebody has access to that, we can add it if not. Um, on the planning board, we often call on the Shade Tree Committee to seek their advice on planting lists. They provide thoughtful plans that work with our overarching ecosystem goals of the town. I recognize the applicant has native shrubs and trees listed, which is a positive, but I also noticed it looks like some of these trees or shrubs are sort of randomly dropped onto the rendering. So I'm having trouble following the logic on this, but on the part of the plan closest to Mergewood Road, the pavement goes right up to the abutter property line. So the project depends on the abutter installing screening. Okay, if you could look to, um, Okay. Could could you come down to the next um, the next visual? I think you have three. Okay, keep going. Okay. All right. Okay. It seems that I'm seeing a newer version than I had. So um, so I would like to update some of my comments here. You have a row of trees, okay. Can I understand the line of uh, shrubs closest to Mer Mergewood? Um, is, this, is this what you have in mind, uh, Madam Chair? Yes, yeah, in there. Yes, thank you, Mr. Schumer. Do you know what kind of shrubs those are along Mergewood? Um, I believe it's in the planting list. I'm not sure if our landscape architect is on the line tonight. Okay. I, I don't think she she is. Um, okay. I'm sorry. There were two sets of plans, and apparently the, the set of plan that I looked at didn't have that row of shrubs. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure... Okay. Um, per perhaps I could offer to to get clarification from the landscape architect and and provide that information to you. Um, okay. Once we once we finish, and I right. apologize for not that's having the, the landscape architect on the line tonight. No, that's that's quite all right, and I'm I'm sorry I I didn't realize there were that many sets of plans on there. Um, I I am I'm happy to see that there is a row because on the earlier rendering I did not see a row of shrubs or plants right there. I'm I'm concerned that they're not tall enough, and I'm concerned that they were dependent on um, the abutters property to provide buffer. Um, but I I may stand corrected with this newest version. Um, but um, I, I I did want to point out that. Um, Trees, shrubs, and ground cover can absorb 30% of the water that lands on a site if planned thoughtfully. Um, and I would consider trees and shrubs that are heavy drinkers to assist with water absorption on the site. I do not see a shadow study or a tree management plan. A shadow study is needed to ensure that plantings will survive. For instance, I would hope that the huge beech tree is to be saved, protecting the old beautiful trees would make a positive difference for the people that live there. In special permits, we typically require a certified inventory of trees on the site by an arborist. A description of what trees need to be removed for health, safety, for foundations, and utility installation. A list and a map of existing trees that are going to be kept and protected on the site. The construction management would then include a tree management plan and all the ways the trees would be protected during and after construction. We've had a huge, we've had huge beautiful trees fall down after developers have left a site because those trees were slowly killed by the suffocation of having the roots driven over repeatedly or parked on or from having piles of rock, dirt, pipes, or concrete left on top of their root systems, suffocating them and preventing air and water from getting in for their survival. Standard conditions that the planning board would require therefore include the tree trees drip line and their roots get fenced during construction. Subcontractors be informed through signage and written notice not to park on, drive over, or to put equipment or materials on the drip line of the trees or plants that are to be protected. 
If there is a period of time during construction when graded land is left open, invasive plants move in and they do not absorb water like native trees, plants, or grasses. In the past year, I've conducted two site visits on other sites where they are having a terrible time because they stripped the land and didn't plant it for a year or more. The sites were covered with invasive plants and removal of them is very difficult. Poisons are not ideal because the invasive plants are interwoven with plants and trees that you want to grow. And poison is not good near any water that flows elsewhere. Requiring a time limit on how long construction can go and requiring a landscape plan makes sense. One suggested condition would be the requirement of a detailed long-term maintenance and planting plan that the developer will implement while on site and maintenance of the plan will transfer over to the property manager and new owner when the developer has completed the project. Timely plantings and the monitoring of and addressing of invasive plants during construction is an important condition in a construction management plan. It's about being a good neighbor too. Invasive plants can easily spread and harm neighbors' trees and plantings. Possible conditions there will be a detailed long-term maintenance plan for the preserved trees and new trees planted on site and the developer will implement while on site and, and the maintenance of the plan will transfer over to the property manager and new owner when the developer has completed the project. The developer shall replace any protected trees or shrubs that may fail to survive and thrive on the site with equivalent value of trees. The developer shall maintain the landscaping in good condition free from litter. To demonstrate that there will be enough sun for the proposed plant life, shrubs and trees to survive, the applicant will provide a shadow study. Um, one final point, I was looking at our earlier plan and I noticed um, there was a stockade fence along Holmes Lane. And I just wanted to um, note that it, it does need to be pushed back, I would say another 10, 12 feet away from the abutter line for snow plowing drop off space on Holmes Lane. I, I don't think the shrubs um, that were shown on the on the Holmes Lane side of the plan um, will survive with the snow and ice treatment of salt, because I think that they're just going to get, they're going to be part of a snow bank practically. So um, and, and some of the mature trees shown in this visual don't exist. Um, if, if you intend to plant your trees here, they, they would go on the landscape and maintenance plan. So um, I have some other potentially relevant conditions for you to consider. Uh, refuse and garbage disposal and recycling, any outside trash dumpsters or trash and recyc recycling receptacles will be sealed closed screen from public view at all times and um, not designed in a way that they are an attractive nuisance to children. I, I didn't know if you had an enclosure. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't have time to study that. Um, and I also wanted to note that private trash pickup twice a week is standard at a site like this with this level of um, this number of residents. Um, and the following is a suggested possible condition from a site plan approval from 36 Central and 131 Elliott. It's a multi-story. Those are both multi-story mixed use developments, but I, I thought this would be applicable. Maintenance of the site, all areas of the site, including the building exterior, landscaping plants, seating, lighting, railings, fencing, and other features shall be constructed by the applicant at its own expense. Thereafter, all areas, including building exterior, landscaping plants, seating, lighting, railings, fencing, and other features shall be maintained in good condition, free and clear of litter, debris, by the applicant at its own expense in perpetuity, including the cost of electricity and the cost of water for watering and provision for convenient water source. Um, clearance of ice and snow from the driveway, sidewalks, parking areas shall be the responsibility of the applicant. Um, construction of the new buildings on site must be done with care and industry standard best practices must be followed to ensure that inconveniences to residents and disruption of traffic is kept to a minimum. These are just conditions that I took out of similar projects I thought might be helpful for you. Um, construction vehicle arrival and departure times um, could be set in relation to school hours. Um, perhaps the hours could be from 10 to 6 
to avoid the school rush hours. Um, in addition to that, you could require police details. Um, if you had a situation where you had multiple construction vehicles planning to go out, you know, at a busy time or um, during peak hours. Um, and this, this is something that we've had to do on a couple of sites, limit the idling of construction vehicles for the consideration of neighbors and the environment. Um, you know, our town planner may have some suggested language for this. Um, the goal being to limit noise, air, and environmental pollution. Um, on a site like this, I, I would require a left turn only sign out of the site. Um, we want the trucks to return to the highway and not to drive all over town with a trail of dust, dirt, or debris causing damage, wear and tear on the roads all over town. Um, I, I, I've also seen um, recommendations for daily dust control measures. I mean, it's basically hosing down the dust um, each day on and off site, so even on the roadways. Commencement and uh, completing of construction. Um, I, I, I took this from the 36 Central Avenue Special Permit Site Plan Approval. Construction shall commence within two years from the date the permit becomes final and sh shall be substantially completed within three years from that date. It's really important to give projects like this an end date um, for a variety of reasons. Um, um, it's also important, I noticed, uh, I noticed the letter from the select board and I, I thought that was excellent. I, I wanted to reiterate one of their, one of their points, but I, I support all of them. It's important to have a condition requiring offsite snow removal Otherwise, you would risk the snow plows scraping the oil and debris from the pavement and pushing the snow with that oil and those debris um, from the pavement um, into the earth that runs into the wetlands. So that's a concern, especially along the Mergewood roadside of the property. Um, and then I, I know there's some been, been a lot of discussion about the sec secondary access. I just want to point out that's a, that's a safety issue. Um, so the applicant must establish legal right to use Mergewood Road for this use. Um, you know, the applicant is required to demonstrate a secondary or emergency access provision in response to concerns raised by public safety officials. Um, and then just um, property management documents. The applicant and his successors and assigns shall be responsible for ensuring that the building's tenants observe all conditions in this approval by providing appropriate terms in any tenant leases and in the master deed and declaration of trust as appropriate for the property. So um, the, the question of public good, on the planning board, when I have an applicant before me asking for multiple waivers or variances, I ask, is there a hardship to the developer if the waiver or variance is not granted? Oftentimes there isn't. Um, it's simply that the developer wants to cut corners to save money. I also ask, what is the public benefit in granting that specific waiver or variance? Um, so there is a public good in providing affordable housing. And in this case, that public good of affordable housing should ideally be balanced with the goal of creating housing that serves those who are in need of affordable housing. It can't only be about the developer's pocketbook. The developer can lower the number of units on this lot and make a good profit. I've learned that developers are excellent problem solvers. If this project goes forward as affordable housing, then the key goal in my mind is to find that sweet spot for a footprint and a density that will make this the best development that it can be for its inhabitants, those in need of affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to speak or comment this evening? Okay, well, I thank you all for thoughtful presentations and comments. Um, this has been a long process uh, for the members of the board. Um, I can assure you we have never talked about it amongst ourselves, and so it will be an interesting process when we when we, when we actually begin to discuss and deliberate on what's the, what's the right approach here. So we have 40 days uh, to go through this process. And uh, I think that brings us all into a date in early, uh, early May. Uh, 
that we have to actually have a decision finalized and, and filed. And so we'll begin that process forthwith. And so I guess one of the things I want to do this evening with my fellow board members is to talk about at least a, an initial schedule uh, for us to have public meetings. Um, I would be inclined to get started next week and I would be inclined, frankly, to do a couple of nights a week um, if possible. And uh, maybe at least we could schedule, begin to schedule for next week. We're gonna run into April vacation fairly soon. And I know I'm not gonna be around during April vacation week. So uh, I think as many hearings as we can get or meetings that we can get in before that day would be great. So uh, I'm happy to hear from you, Mike and Ted about what you think about how we should schedule this and you know, whether or not we have some availability for, for next week to begin the process. Okay, I'll let you go. You, you're the oldest, so I'll let you go first. Uh, I can start the process next week. Um, any any this, nice this is, to... <laughs> hmm? Go ahead. No, I was going to say this. This is a this is actually a tough time for, period for me because I'm in the process of winding down my law practice and retiring, um, which I we have to be out of our space by April 30th. So we might we might as well start as soon as possible. Okay. Uh, so if we have to do a couple of nights next week, we're gonna. Um... Yeah, these will be public meetings, not public hearings. So I mean, right. Mike, Mike Brown, what are you? What's your pleasure next week? Yeah, I I agree, Mr. Chair. I think we should try to um, take every measure we can to get get through this quickly. Um, I expect that the writing process will will take a while, and so. Let's <laughs> uh, let's give Judy as much as much time as uh, she needs. Um, so I'm willing to to start with a couple of times a week. Sounds good to me. I'm also um, on another ODB application panel that's meeting not every week, but um, every other week or every third Wednesday. Um, but I think we can uh, we can probably schedule a couple of days next week to start and and maybe even beyond that. Well, why don't we just, why don't we schedule for next week and then we can, when we get, see where we stand at the end of a couple of meetings next week, we can, we can begin to uh, add some additional meetings. I would suggest uh, Tuesday and Thursday nights at seven. Does that work for people? Mr. Chair, yeah. I can join you Thursday night, but I can't join you Tuesday night. I have a public hearing on a zoning work. Okay. Um, what other nights work for you, Judy? I think it's important that you be there. We need Thursday. We, we, Desperately need guidance in this process, so we need we need you to be available. Thursday night is fine. I, I can do it. What about okay. Wednesday night, the thirtieth? It's town meeting season, Mike. I'm sorry, I got meetings every <laughs> so bad. Um, next week is rough, but Thursday night I do have open. And you know, if the board wants to start talking. I was going to say, why don't we why don't we start Tuesday night and kind of begin to just lay out the the groundwork and figure out where we are and what we need to do. And um, and then we'll pick it up again on Thursday night with with Judy's presence and assistance. We can uh, we can go forward from there. And then you know at the close of business on Thursday night, we can we can schedule some more meetings. But I think it's a good idea to get underway um, and, and begin to talk amongst ourselves for the first time publicly about you know, where we think we stand and what we need to do in order to reach a reach a decision that Judy can help us with. And if it's a positive decision, to help us fashion. Uh, uh, conditions uh, in light of all of the many materials that have pre been presented to us, including the materials and testimony that's been presented tonight. So why don't we agree to meet at seven o'clock on Tuesday night? Um, I guess that's March 29th. 20, 29th. And then again on Thursday night, March 31st at seven o'clock. Those will be public meetings in connection with this application. If, if I don't have to be with the other town very long on Tuesday night, I'll just jump into this meeting. Um, That's you know, great. I think the only thing that I would just want to point out, I think the board's probably very aware of this, but just for the public that may not be, once you go into these public meetings for deliberation, everybody else who's been panelist goes off. Right, right. There's no public input at that point. You can, people can observe the process, obviously, yeah. but there's no further. This is the end of public input tonight. And, and I should add that we've had tremendous input uh, during this process. This has been a long process and we've had a great deal of information presented to us by both sides. 
Um, and I think I think it's been extremely helpful. I mean, obviously, this is a big project. It's generated a lot of interest, and, and we we appreciate the significance of the issues that are presented. And and we'll do our level best to reach uh, an appropriate decision, um, one way or another. So. So I guess we'll meet again at seven o'clock on Tuesday, March 29th, and again on Thursday, March 31st at seven, and, and we'll figure out at the close of that uh, session uh, what, further, what further dates will, will work. So thanks to all for your participation tonight, and uh, please feel free to um, watch as we begin the deliberation and discussion process uh, next Tuesday. Thank you. Before we go, uh, Mr. Chair, if I if I could, just because I'm about to uh, to lose my panelist rights as well, uh, I'd just like to thank you and members of the board, Mr. Reardon, uh, Ms. Barrett, and all the members of the public who participated in the process. Uh, thank you very much. Thank I, you. I, I would echo that as well, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board. You've been an extraordinary group um, and really have gone over, bent over backwards to make sure that all views have been heard. Uh, as often as has been felt necessary. And so I really appreciate the time and effort you've all put into this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, thank you.